All right, homework questions. Let's sit up there. You all got the homework problems we'll put on the website? Yes. Uh, 2008, 2-5. Uh, Non-stoichiometric solid lithium sulfide. <coughs> LI2S. The majority point defects are interstitial lithium, ion, lithium ions on one side and lithium ion vacancies on the other side. Compound energy formalism, N members, write an equation for the Gibbs energy. Uh, give linear equation showing how the N member Gibbs energies. The formalism parameters may be expressed in terms of the Gibbs energies of real compounds and physically meaningful model parameters. All right, so the model is here. So we have uh, lithiums. We have the lithium. Sub we have three sublattices basically. You have the lithium sublattice. You have the sulfur sublattice, and then you have an interstitial lattice. Uh, and this corner over here is stoichiometric. The, okay, the sulfur sublattice is always occupied by sulfur, so we could ignore it. The only two lattices that matter are the lithium lattice, the metal lattice, and the and the interstitial lattice. This corner represents uh, stoichiometric lithium sulfide, Li2S, with the sublattice occupied entirely, the, the lithium at the interstitial lattice completely vacant. So this is your stoichiometric Li2S. Uh, over here you have the, now what we're doing is we're going along this way and we're putting lithium ions into the vacants, into the interstitial sites. So this is your hypothetical compound where all the interstitial sites are occupied by lithium. I've written an N here because it isn't clear, it isn't given in these in the um, problem, the ratio of lithium sites to interstitial sites. So the number of if you have Li2S, how many interstitial sites do you have? Are the face center, are the uh, tetrahedral holes, octahedral holes? We're not sure of the ratio, so I just put an N. This is the number of vacant, the number of interstitial sites for every two lattice sites. It's unknown in this particular example. Of course, it's only this little corner of composition down here where anything happens. You never, of course, go way over here. You only put a few lithium interstitial atoms. You only introduce a few vacancies here. Up here, we have the uh, hypothetical solution where all the lithium ions have become vacancies. So this is vacancy, vacancy, S. And up here, we have then both. This is not the same thing as this is all. This is both defects are complete. All the interstitial sites are filled with lithium and all the lithium sites are filled with vacancies. Okay. This is the corner over here where the actual material is. X and Y basically are the, the concentrations of the two kinds of defects. So X is the site fraction of lithium on the interstitial lattice. Y is the site fraction of vacancies on the lithium lattice. N is the number of, little n here is the number of moles of interstitial sites per mole of Li2S. It's something like one, two, three, so an integer. Okay, so the Gibbs energy then is, well, 1 minus x times 1 minus y times the Gibbs energy of this thing, plus x times 1 minus y times the Gibbs energy of this thing, plus this, plus x, y times the Gibbs energy of the thing up at the corner. Uh, plus, then you have for the mixing on the, on, the reg on the lattice sites, on the lithium sites, you have a 2 here because there are two, two moles of uh, lattice sites, of metal sites. And you have an N over here because there are N moles of interstitial sites for every two moles of lithium sites. Okay, so the uh, lithium and the vacancies mix randomly on their sites, and the vacan interstitial vacancies and lithium interstitials mix randomly on their sites. Where these N member terms here are the Gibbs energy, G naught of this thing is the Gibbs energy of hypothetical defect free lithium sulfide. This will be close to the Gibbs energy of real stoichiometric lithium sulfide, which you would measure in an experiment, but not exactly, because real stoichiometric lithium sulfide contains a small number of both kinds of vacancies. Uh, delta G1 is a model parameter, and this will be the Gibbs energy. Let's do it the other way around. Delta G1 would be the Gibbs energy of... Delta G1 is the Gibbs energy of this compound, this hypothetical compound, minus the Gibbs energy of this compound. So it's the energy per mole to enter them. It's the molar energy of putting uh, lithium ions on the interstitial sites. Okay, so the G0s here, these G0s of these three corners over here 
these these three quarters, these are G0s are what I call the formalism parameters. They aren't numbers that represent real compounds or anything. They're the numbers that you put into your into your formalism. The model parameters are things that have physical meaning. And in this case, this G0 minus this G0 is the Gibbs energy of putting lithium ions into the interstitial site. So that's a real parameter. And this G0 minus this G0 is the Gibbs energy of putting uh, vacancies on the lithium sites, and that's a real model parameter too. Remember, you never ever get over here. You're only talking about a small region here. Okay, so I would then say the Gibbs energy of this hypothetical N member is the Gibbs energy of your stoichiometric Li2S plus your model parameter, delta G1. The Gibbs energy of this hypothetical N member is the Gibbs energy of the stoichiometric material plus delta G2, which is your model parameter. Both of these will be positive. Delta G1 and delta G2 will be positive because it takes positive energy to create defects. Otherwise, the thing would just be complete defects. Right? And the G naught of the far corner is basically the sum of these two. Because this is putting both, this is putting both, uh, both types of defects on. So it's the Gibbs energy of the stoichiometric material plus the Gibbs energy to form this defect plus the Gibbs energy to form this defect. Okay, where well, delta G1, which could probably be written as a function of t, because it would be this is the, the b would h a here is the a1 would be the uh, enthalpy of forming the of forming the defect, and b would be the uh, minus b would be the non-configurational entropy of forming the defect. Same thing for this defect here. Yeah. Is there any uh, relationship between the uh, side fraction of uh, Vacancy and cation site, uh, cation that is, and with the uh, side fraction of the uh, lithium and interstitial subplates. Because we use. Well, no, it depends on which side of the stoichiometry you are. They're both dependent on the overall composition. But yeah, sure there is. Yes, because if you, <coughs> there definitely is because you can't, uh, you can't just create as much of one as you want. There's an equilibrium constant between them. Okay, so we can use like a. Uh, equal size fractions, like only x or only uh, because no, here we used y and x. Yeah. Well, y and x are going to be related by the overall composition of the uh, by your overall deviation from stoichiometry. So you're going to have your phase diagram. You'll have lithium sulfur mole fraction of sulfur. Here is Li2s, and so your overall composition is somewhere here. If you're right at this composition here, then x equals y. Okay. okay, if you're over on this side, well, I have to go back to the uh, to the course notes, but these are related. I mean, if you, the total amount of lithium and the total amount of sulfur are going to tell you how much you're, a total amount of lithium on either side is going to tell you where you, okay. so you're going to have, you're going to have an, remember we ended up with an equilibrium constant, k was x, y, over 1 minus x times 1 minus y equals exponent of minus delta g1 plus delta g2 over rt. That, okay, so you solve this equilibrium constant for x and y, and you have a mass balance. Because as you move your total, well, you give your total lithium content. If your total lithium content is, say, 0.35, which means you're a little bit from the 33%, then you can work out the total amount of lithium. The total amount of lithium will tell you how much lithium you have. Mass balance will tell you how much lithium you have in the interstitial sites and how much lithium you removed from them. Now, if you're right at 33%, if this is your overall composition, exactly the stoichiometric composition, then every lithium interstitial creates a vacancy. Okay, so the number of lithium interstitials is equal to the number of lithium vacancies because you're starting with stoichiometric Li2S. You're staying at that composition. Okay, so every time you take you take a vacancy, you take a lithium off the lattice site to put it into the interstitial, you're forming a pair of de defect pair. So if you're at 33%, the two have equal amounts. The two defects are of equal concentration. If you're a little bit on one side, you can do a mass balance, and but still the mass balance applies. The two definitely are related by how much for you.
So for a given overall lithium sulfur ratio, you just do a mass balance. Now, to clear what I... Okay, the next one was... Uh, okay, this is this... Uh, Sorry, I put it down too. Okay. So you had this uh, 19. <coughs> I had this uh, 1996 of Fang from All right. Well, this was a similar thing. Then you have a comp compound A. Well, here you go. I think you'll see it here. This is A2 minus delta B1 plus delta, where delta indicates the deviation from stoichiometry. So if delta is zero, you've got A2B, and then you're adding B on this side, you subtract adding delta on this side. Delta just tells you how far you are from the stoichiometric composition. Uh, <clears throat> when delta is less than zero, the principal, the major, majority defects are vacancies on the B sublattice. When delta is greater than zero, the majority defects are B atoms on the A sublattice. Write an equation out for the whole thing. Kind of, so. Okay, same thing as last time. So we go to here. Okay, so this would be, here's your mass balance set. <clears throat> this is, well, I could have just shown you. This is the mass balance. So you've got A, A, B on this lattice with a ratio 2, and you've got B vacancy on this sublattice with a ratio of y to 1 minus y. So there's two sites on here, there's one lattice here. Now this then, I am doing the, uh, the mass balance. 1 plus delta over 3 is the total number of moles of B over the number of moles of A plus the number of moles of B. Now blah, blah, so delta equals going to delta. So this is basically, delta tells you how far you are from stoichiometry. And once you've got a value of delta, then you've got this, this is your mass balance relationship between x and y. Okay, so that's how you would do x and y, given, given your overall stoichiometry of delta, a2 minus delta, b, so on, you would end up with what was the one? It was a2 minus delta, b1 plus delta, I think. Okay, so so it's a to wasn't that was that how it was written? A two minus delta b one plus delta. Okay, that's the um, that's the stoichiometry. Okay, so your your compound is a two minus delta b one plus delta. Okay, so you've got a two b is your stoichiometric compound, and delta tells you where you are on either side. Okay, so you have B is the number of moles of B is 1 plus delta, the number of moles of A plus B is 2 minus delta plus 1 plus delta, which is uh, um, 3. So 1 plus delta 3 is this. Number of moles of B is 2 times 1 minus X plus Y, and the number of moles of A plus B is 2 plus Y, and you can solve this, of course, is all done by fact stage for you. Okay, so you know where your overall stoichiometry is. And by the way, okay, so let's say delta to be zero. If delta is zero, then this whole thing comes out to be zero when you find out here at the A2B composition. X, e X equals uh, 3Y, I think, or something like that. Okay, so anyway, so we once again we have the, uh, imagine the same little square as last time. G is XY times G of A2B plus 1 minus XY. Okay, where the uh, RT2X, so you have two. It's two here because you have two lattice sites here. It's one here because you have one lattice site here. <clears throat> These are your four N member Gibbs energies. This is the Gibbs energy of the stoichiometric A2B. This is the Gibbs energy of the B2B hypothetical compound. This is the hypothetical compound A2 vacancy. And this is the hypothetical compound in the far corner with both. Same thing as last time. Uh, we set dgdx equals, so that is your final expression right there. 
uh, no, to actually write the whole thing out to, to solve it. We'll set, uh, this is what Faxage does, this is your Gibbs energy expression. Uh, Faxage finds the value of x and y, which minimizes the Gibbs energy. So dg dx equals dg dy equals zero. Okay. And this thing out, so this is dg dx dy is zero, so we end up with this whole thing being equal to zero. We let g naught of the double defect one be as we did before, that gives energy of the forming both defects. So we substitute uh, that into there. Let delta g naught one be the energy of forming one defect, delta g naught two be the energy of forming the other defect. And we end up with x squared over y, one minus x squared, one minus y is the exponent of. That's the same as before, but you have the two, two here, which may put the one. Is that okay, or do you want to get more detail through it? Or? Think about that. I think it's because we're looking. That's the total number of moles of. I have to write it down. Yes, that's the total number of moles of lattice sites on the two lattices that you're talking about, isn't it? The. Um, it's not the total. The, the lattice sites are the A sites and the vacancies. How many moles of A sites and vacancies? It's not how many moles of like the B sites are totally occupied by B. Is that correct? The A sites. Well, the A site's totally occupied by A. Okay, so that's a. Then you have the B sites and the vacancies. So the two actual lattices where you're doing the mixing are the B sites and the interstitial sites. The total number of B sites plus interstitial sites is 1 minus delta. It's not 1. The total number of A plus B sites is 1, but the total number of B sites plus the total number of interstitial sites is 1 minus delta. I do believe. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Any more on this one, or is this? Okay, but you always end up with an equilibrium constant, which looks like the squareds here simply because it's A2B. Okay, so this is the number of defects, the defects, F defects times the number of non defect sites, and these are all X and Y are quite small. Okay, so there's an equilibrium constant for the formation of the defects. Okay. And you'll see too when you do this that this expression here is also, whatever you end up with in here is always quite small. X, X and Y are small, they're the vacancy, they're the defect concentrations. Okay, the defects are there in small amounts, so the X and Y are quite small. The X and Y are quite small, so whatever you get here, this x plus y, there'll be something here which has to do with the mass balances, but that will always be reasonably constant. The delta g1 and delta g2 are your uh, main thing. So this whole thing is pretty much constant.
I did here just to show that people don't understand this. I was at a meeting where people that use these things, CalFAD, and there was a simple, like this is your, do something very simple, this would be A, V, vacancies on both lattices. So here you'd have vacancy B, and here you'd have vacancy vacancy. All right. Okay, so this is, you're dealing with the region down here. So you'd have your delta G1 is the G0 of A vacancy minus the G0 of AB and so on for the other ones. This is the simplest case, vacancy, vacancy. And then people that seem you'll see this in CalFed and so on. This is your so this G0 of this, G0 of AB is the Gibbs energy of your hypothetical stoichiometric compound, which is very close to the Gibbs energy of real AB, as long as you don't have a large deviation from stoichiometry. This G naught of A vacancy has nothing to do with the Gibbs energy of real. I'd say, well, this is A vacancy, but this isn't pure A. I mean, AB could be something like sodium chloride. This is not the Gibbs energy of sodium. This is the Gibbs energy of some hypothetical compound where you've got vacancies here, and it's another totally different crystal structure and everything. Nothing to do with the Gibbs energy of, of pure A. Okay, it's a hypothetical compound. The difference between this and this is the Gibbs energy of putting vacancies on the B sublattice. Okay, I mean sodium and sodium chloride are totally different structures. This would be some sort of a hypothetical compound with the sodium chloride structure with vacancies on all the chlorine sites, which has nothing to do with real sodium. And similarly, this up here is not the Gibbs energy of chlorine. This is the and this, but you'll see where people will then take this to be the Gibbs energy of pure A. And this is the Gibbs energy of pure B. And then, of course, you've got to put in all sorts of G excess terms in order to make the thing work right. And that's not what the model's all about. And then even crazier, they'll set the Gibbs energy of this to be zero because they say, well, that's just a vacant lattice. They call it vacansonium. And people will say the Gibbs energy of vacant sodium must be zero. Well, no, it's not zero. It's this plus this minus this. It's a huge, big positive number. It's the Gibbs energy of removing all the forming defects everywhere. It's, it's not an empty lattice. It's a hypothetical energy of forming a total, totally removing all the defects. Okay, so if you go, if you start saying that this is the Gibbs energy of real A, and this is the Gibbs energy of real A, and this is the Gibbs energy of zero, you're going to get something really crazy out here. This is just a hypothetical number. This minus this is approximately constant. This minus this is approximately constant. And this is the sum of this plus this minus this. Then you get a nice Henry and composition. All right. So now we are into number 17. Okay, so. One more problem. 17. For an hour and complete both and salt things. Finding a zirconium. Liquid solutions of alkali chloride, alkali chloride and zirconium tetrachloride have been proposed as an electrolyte to refine zirconium. Zirconium tetrachloride, ZrCl4, is not a molten salt, it's a molecule like carbon tetrachloride, it's a gas or a liquid. Okay, but it's, it's a molecular liquid, it's ZrCl4 held together with van der Waals forces. It's not molten salt at all, it's not ionic whatsoever. Highly high vapor pressure, it's not an ionic salt, it's like, a, like carbon tetrachloride, it's a molecule. Uh, they've been proposed to refine all the zirconium. A part of the equilibrium diagram of NaCl, ZrCl4 is shown here. Uh, calculate the activity of sodium chloride at these experimental points, indicated by the red circles. 
Uh, okay, this is the temperature, and this gives you the ratio of zirconium tetrachloride. Uh, this gives you the mole fraction, basically, of zirconium tetrachloride on this basis. I uh, propose a model for the solutions, what ions are found in the solution, and the heat effusion of sodium chloride is given. Okay, the whole thing in here is that although pure zirconium tetrachloride over on this side is forms of gaseous it's a molecular, when you have it rich in an alkali halide, what you form is you form the sodium chloride plus the ZrCl4 forms sodium ZrCl, it forms complex ions. You form sodium ions and you form ZrCl6 complex anions. It becomes ionic. The ZrCl4 picks up two chlorines and forms a complex anion ZrCl6, hexachlorozirconate. And so you end up with a solution which is sodium ions on the cation sites and on the anion sites you have chloride ions and you have ZrCl6 4 minus anions. It's very much like the example I gave you last time where you have something like KCl and over here you have MgCl2 and on this side of the phase diagram up to 33 percent you're going to have potassium ions, chlorine ions and MgCl4 complex anions. Okay, so I said in this we call this the basic or the ionic region you'll have potassium ions on this site and on the other side you'll have chlorine and MgCl4 complex ions mixing randomly on the anion sites. And this works up to 33%. When you get to 33%, then you have the composition K2MgCl4. You've used up all the chlorine. Now, if you go to the other side, you've got to have a more complicated model. But in this particular system, even if you get richer in magnesium chloride than 33%, you still have an ionic solution because magnesium chloride is an ionic solution. If you get in this system, though, with ZrCl4, when you pass you can do the same thing. You could put here NaCl and ZrCl4, and over on this side here, on the basic side, you're getting this model, but you're going to reach the composition here of Na2 ZrCl6. At that point, you've used up all the chlorine coming from the sodium, and when you go over on this side, then your system is no longer going to be ion completely ionic. And you're going to have molecules, it'll be very complicated molecules mixing with ions and your vapor pressure will go shooting way up because now you've no longer stabilized the, the ZrCl4 is normally a very volatile liquid because it's only held together by van der Waals forces, it's molecular. But when it's in a rich solution of an alkali chloride, it forms an ionic salt and it's very stable, very low vapor pressure. When you get to the other side, however, the vapor pressure goes shooting way up but at least up to 33% zirconium tetrachloride is pretty close to being uh, an ionic solution. <clears throat> it's exactly the same thing when we use in the Hall cell for the electrolyte in the Hall cell. In the Hall cell for making aluminum, okay, you'll have sodium fluoride, and over here you'll have aluminum fluoride. And aluminum fluoride is also not an ionic material. Aluminum fluoride is actually a dimer, ALF3-2, but it's a molecule, very, very volatile. It's a non-ionic, it's a molecular liquid consisting of dimers held together by basically van der Waals forces, extremely volatile, so on. You cannot electrolyze it because it's not an electrolyte. But when you put it over on this side, then you end up with sodium ions, and over here you'll have fluorine ions, you'll have ALF4 ions, You'll have some ALF5 ions, uh, and according to Patrice, you don't have any ALF6 ions, even though that's what people thought you had. So it's very, anyway, over on this side, up to a, an AL4, it's quite stable, low vapor pressure, because it's become ionic. As soon as you pass a certain composition here, though, you don't have any, you don't have enough fluoride anymore, then you start to get molecules again, and the vapor pressure goes way up. Okay, you obviously can't electrolyze something over here because it's not an electrolyte, it's not an ionic conductor. You can electrolyze it over in this. Yeah, so that's the formation of cryolite solution. All right, anyway, here you're supposed to play around with, all right, what are the complex ions? They could be ZR, I, I tell you they're ZrCl4, but they might be ZrCl5. I mean ZrCl6, they might be ZrCl5, they might 
they're going to be something higher than 4 because ZRCL4 is neutral. It might be ZRCL5, ZRCL6, ZRCL6 sounds like a good guess. Um, and these then are the results. So I am assuming I knew the answer. Okay, so RT log activity of sodium fluoride. This is just your liquidus, your liquidus um, equation when you have no solid solution. One we used a long time ago, RT log activity of sodium chloride is the heat of fusion of sodium chloride to TOT fusion. So along the liquidus line, just from my standard equation, I can calculate the activity of sodium chloride. Okay, so these are, this is the experimental liquidus composition, experimental temperature, and this is the activity of sodium chloride as you're going along the liquidus. So how do we explain this? We're going to assume an ideal Temkin solution as we did last week for the solvent. Sodium chloride is the solvent. So it's there a major amount, so we will uh, be assuming that it's a uh, first approximation, it's an ideal realty solution of the ions. So again, in that case, the activity of sodium chloride is the product of the site fractions, the product of the site fraction of sodium times the site fraction of chlorine. So I'm going to use this model, using the model, the model which I'm proposing, see if it works, is sodium, all the cation sites are occupied by sodium, and on the other sites you have chlorine and zirconium mixing randomly. Okay, so the, now what is the number, so times the, so the site fraction of sodium is 1, because it's occupied only by sodium. What is the site fraction of chlorine? Well, the number of chlorines then is equal to what? The number of chlorines is equal the number of um, Sorry, not ZRCL4, ZRCL6. <coughs> the number of ZRCL6 ions is equal to the number of ZRCL4s, which you add, of course. Every ZRCL4 for this is ZRCL6. The number of chlorine ions is equal to the number of sodium chlorides minus two times the number of ZRCL4s, because every sodium chloride supplies a chlorine ion, every ZRCL4 removes two of them to form a ZRCL6. Okay, so the numerator here then, uh, the numerator is the number of chlorine ions, and the denominator is the total number of negative ions, the number of chlorine ions plus the number of ZRCL6 ions. So this is the total number of chlorine ions in the numerator, this is the total number of negative ions. And converting that back into mole fractions, you end up with that. And if you then take this X ZRCL4, and you substitute it into here, you end up with something that comes very close to what's observed. And of course that goes to zero when the mole fraction of zirconium chloride is equal to a third. And thereafter it's very, so it's a very, very low active, comp the activity of sodium chloride, uh, down the activity of zirconium chloride will also be very low on this site and then starts to grow very rapidly on the other side. So in this ionic region, you can then uh, electrolyze the, uh, the zirconium because we have an ionic salt and the vapor pressure is quite low. Yep. Uh, that's H-O. Does fax H use those equations? Does he calculate only one third of the graph? and use another model to calculate the remaining part? Well, we don't use this simple, uh, we don't use the complex ion model in our actual FactSage databases. You could include it yourself if you wanted to. Uh, but then, yeah, your model would only apply over that, that region. Well, yeah, because you'd have to set it up. You would have to set it up as a, uh, as a compound energy formalism, so you, you're not actually defining any compositions. You'd have to enter your end members as uh, your. You'd have to enter it as your end members as sodium and as NaCl and Na2ZrCl6. Okay, otherwise you're going to end up with a negative mole fraction. So you could enter it yourself if you made up your own database using the solution program as NaCl and Na2ZrCl6, and then of course it would only apply over that region. Your model is undefined beyond that, and well, even your mole fractions are undefined by that. beyond that. You have to define. Your model has to define ionic or site fractions, and your site fractions are going to become negative as you go beyond that. We don't use the complex ion model per se explicitly in fact state, but I'll explain 
maybe today or certainly next week. What do we do? Um, it's similar, but. Okay, that was 17, 4, 17, uh, Okay, this is the same sort of thing. A slide consists of 60 kilograms of silica, calcium oxide, and iron oxide. It's an equilibrium with iron liquid. Calculate PO2 as well as the uh, oxygen content of the iron liquid using the Temkin model for the slag. The main point here is the Temkin model for slag, uh, which basically says in a slag which is rich in basic oxides, or that is not rich in silica, if you've got over here, this is your mole fraction of silica, and zero when you're in this region here, where you've got a lot of calcium oxide and iron oxide, very little silica, then you have calcium ions and iron ions on. You have the metal ions on the cation sites, and on the anion sites you have oxygen ions and <coughs> orthosilicate ions on the sites. And this is your basic slide region, holding up to about 33% silica. This is the approximate model that you can use. All the silicas are basically formed orthosilicates. These are basic slags. In that region, they're very, very fluid. They're not viscous because the silicate doesn't form a network. It forms discrete, negative, small negative ions. Okay, so in the basic region, your slag is like a molten salt. It has a low, low viscosity, high conduct, ionic conductivity. Every silicon is bonded, not bonded through any sort of a bridge to other silicon. Okay, so it's very, very similar to what we had before. And of course, the total number of oxygen ions uh, will be the number of calcium oxides plus the number of iron oxides, minus two times the number of silicons, because the total oxygens are supplied by CaO and FeO, and every SiO2 removes two oxygens to form an SiO4, and the number of moles of silicate, of orthosilicates, is equal to the number of moles of SiO2. Now, why don't we have iron 3 plus? Because I told you it's an equilibrium with iron, so you know it's under reducing conditions. So the amount of iron 3 plus is going to be very small. <coughs> okay, so the answer is. Okay, so we start off with, uh, I convert the mass into the number of moles of the three components up here. Okay, so the number of calcium ions is 1499.6, the number of iron ions is 1500.3, the total number of positive ions then going on the positive ion sites is that. The number of silicas is equal to the number of SiO2s. And the number of oxygen ions, as I said, is the number of calcium plus the number of FeO minus twice the number of silica. So that's the total number of oxygen, free oxygen ions that are not bound up in the SiO4s. And this is the total number of negative ions. The activity of FeO then, since it is a more or less a solvent, it's the major constituent. It's as so Henry, uh, Grail's law, not exact but approximate, is the product of the site fractions. Site fraction of iron is 1,500 over the total positive ions. Site fraction of oxygen is 1,002 over the total number of negative ions. And that's your rail chain activity of FeO in this simple model, taking into account the actual ions that are present. Okay. Assuming random mixing on the two lattices, uh, assuming that all other terms are, that, that you're in the Reynolds law range. Okay, and assuming that the silica is all in the form of the silicate ions. So that's the main thing I was after. If you want to do the rest of it, you have Fe plus oxygen is FeO. We have a delta G zero. That's your K. It's RT log K, which is equal to the activity of FeO squared over the activity of iron PO2. The activity of FeO is here. Uh, the activity of iron is one because it's an equilibrium with essentially pure iron. So you can calculate the equilibrium oxygen pressure. <coughs> Uh, then you have O2 gas forms two oxygen ion, two oxygen atoms dissolved in the steel. The equilibrium constant, the Sievert's law constant for that was given, which is 
mole fraction of oxygen squared over PO2. You have the PO2, so you can calculate the mole fraction of oxygen dissolved in the steel in the equivalent of the side. Probably not too bad a calculation as long as you're dealing with these basics like when you do a fast calculation, you're not going to be too far off if you do that, maybe 20%, 10%. Yeah, Inside the basic region, what model do you propose for this? Uh, Inside the basic region? Wait till next week. We're going to get a whole lecture on that one. Okay, this is just leading up to that one. But this is to show you that basic slags tend to be, the model is quite simple, generally. Well, this is approximate model. I mean, if you want to get it exact, then it's more complicated. Uh, in the acid region, it's anything but simple. <laughs> It's very simple here, becomes less simple here, and then rapidly becomes extraordinarily complicated. <laughs> All right, that was 14. I think 17 is probably similar. This is a similar one. Uh, slide containing copper oxide. The liquid slide contains, again, silica, FeO, CaO, and Cu2O. Calculate the activity of copper oxide and FeO in the slag, again, assuming the basic slag. Uh, the slag is at equilibrium with liquid copper. Calculate the iron content of the copper. Uh, I use the Eligan diagram. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Well, you don't have an Eligan diagram, so you can't do that. <laughs> but it's the first part, anyway, that's important. It's pretty much the same as the one we just did. Um, I calculated the number of iron ions, when I had 70 moles of FeO, I said, so you have 70 moles of FeO, you have 15 moles of CaO, you have 10 moles of copper, total number of positive ions is 95, the number of silicate ions is equal to the number of, the number of moles of silica, and the number of moles of oxygen ions is given by the number of moles of FeO plus the number of moles of calcium plus half the number of moles of copper because it's Cu2O, uh, minus two times the number of moles of silica, like this, so you end up with 70 moles of oxygen. Thank your model. The model for this solution is iron, copper, calcium, and over here you have oxygen ions and this ion for four minuses, so we do our mass balance. Uh, the activity of FeO then is the product of the site fractions. The site fraction of iron is 70 over 95. The site fraction of oxygen is 70 over 80. And same thing for the activity of copper oxide. Not forgetting the square because it's Cu2O. So it's the site fraction of copper squared, 10 over, 9, 10 over 95 squared, minus 70 over 80. So those are your two activities. If you'd used an elegant diagram and had the numbers, you would have then had copper plus oxygen from Cu2O. Well, the equilibrium oxygen pressure is 2 times 10 to the minus 3. So PO2 over the activity of Cu2O well, is P0. This is, the, this is the equilibrium constant. So the activity of copper oxide is 1. The activity of copper is 1. That's PO2. So PO2 is this. Uh, don't worry about it. Which is what we did before, just trying to calculate the amount of oxygen that's in the copper from the PO2 and the activity. If you know the PO2 and you know the activity of copper oxide, you can calculate the activity. Is that okay? This is the part I'm going to count up here. CO2 is 5 moles. Yeah. Five moles of CO2O, yeah. You have 5 moles of Cu2O, but that gives you 10 moles of copper. But in oxygen displacement, it's 5. This is the. There's 5 moles of Cu2O, so that gives you 10 moles of copper and 5 moles of oxygen. This is 2 times the number of moles of SiO4 here.
2002. All right, we're doing a lot of these same things. Maybe I gave you too much. Anyway, a basic slide contains silica, MnO, and MnS. Assuming the species in solution are manganese, oxygen, sulfur, and SiO4, 4 minus. Uh, the sulfur will be in the form of S as long S2 minus as long as the oxygen pressure is low. Calculate activities for them and O and M and S. Uh, then I do a second one, it's the same thing. A slag, given slag composition, you trace PO2 is 10 to the minus 4, PS2 is the minus 4. Calculate the equilibrium sulfur content of the slag. And uh, I have lost it. So the number of moles of sulfur ions is the number of moles of MnS, the number of moles of orthosilicates, the number of moles of SO2, the number of moles of oxygen is the number of moles of MnO minus twice the number of moles of NO2. The activity of uh, MO should be MnO. Activity of MnO is the site fraction of manganese, which is one times the site fraction of oxygen, which is the number of oxygen, over the total number of negative ions. So the model here is that the yeah, only a basic slag that the one lattice is occupied by only by manganese, the other is occupied by oxygen ions, sulfur ions, and SiO4. All right, so the activity of MO is the site fraction of manganese, which is 1 times the site fraction of oxygen, which is total number of oxygen ions over the total number of negative ions. Comes out to be that. The activity of MS is the number of sulfide ions, which is the number of MS, divided by the total number of negative ions. Okay, so from that you can calculate the activities. Uh, okay, for the reaction, what was the reaction I gave? So we have this reaction. This is actually an interesting reaction for the desulfuration and the sulfur reaction with a uh, between the slag and, and the metal uh, and the gas phase. Well, the gas phase in this case, MnO2 plus sulfur equals MnS plus one half oxygen. And we have a Gibbs energy change for that reaction. So this is the exchange reaction between the oxygen and sulfur in the slag and between the sulfur and oxygen in the gas phase with which it's in equilibrium. All right. So equilibrium constant is going to be delta G minus RT log K and that then is the activity of MS times the PO2 over the activity of MO times PS2. Okay, so PO2 and PS2 are given. <coughs> the activity of MS uh, is this divided by this, the activity of MO is this divided by this, the denominators cancel, so I just put the numerators in. Uh, the activity, the mole fractions are given, so you can solve to get the sulfide content of the slag and equal the of the gas. So for a kind of a back of the envelope type of calculations, um, this for basic slags, 
you can get a you know quickly get a pretty rough rapid thing even if you have minimal data. Uh, <clears throat> all right, there was one last one, 2006 to. Well, it's the same thing again. You got silica, sodium oxide, sodium sulfide. You want the activities. Of, uh, it's almost exactly the same thing. So let's do that fast. All right. Well, okay. Number of sul sil same thing. Number of silicates is silica. Number of sulfurs the number of sodium sulfide. The number of oxygens equal to the number of sodium oxide. The activity is this. Basically the same thing as before. That's the last one. Okay. Any question? All right. So as I said, the material for the exam on Thursday goes up to here. Up to what we just did. Okay. Not beyond. What I'm going to start to talk about now is not for the exam this Thursday. Okay, uh, we talked about, um, this is kind of an aside, we talked about, I talked about defects uh, in ionic crystals and there's a notation which you're going to probably going to come across. So, it's called the Kroger notation. Kroger notation for for defects in ionic compounds. This is kind of a total aside. I just wanted to show you the Kroger notation because you might come across it. Let's. I'm going to give you a, an ionic material, an ionic salt. Let's say you take silver bromide. So normally you would have silver ions on silver sites and you'll have bromine ions on bromine sites. Let's finish it up. All right, that's your normal neutral salt with all the silvers on the silver ions on the silver sites and all the bromine ions on the bromine sites. And uh, Kroger just had a notation for defects. Okay, oh, you know, so you have the silver lattice, you have the bromine lattice, you also in principle have an interstitial lattice, sites where they can go interstitially. And, all right, so what we do is we have a symbol, and the symbol contains here, you have what element you have, down here, this is the this is what this is the actual species. So this is your species. You have a subscript down here. This subscript down here indicates the lattice on which the species is found. And up here you have a symbol which indicates the charge. This is relative charge. And this is the charge relative to what is normally there. Okay. And this is the charge relative to what is normally there. So if normally there's a plus sign, if this is a silver ion, so this would be a silver on a silver lattice site. So this is a silver on a silver lattice. A silver ion, this thing here, on a silver lattice site would have nothing up here, or zero. Because this is, you don't put the plus. The plus is not the actual charge. The, the symbol up here is the charge relative to what is normally there. Okay, so a silver ion, this is this is a silver ion on a silver site with nothing that's blank up here. That's a silver ion on a silver site. Okay, the symbol we use for plus and minus just so it doesn't get confused is this is a positive charge and a little slash like this is a negative charge relative to what's normally there. Okay, a little dot for positive charge, 
a little slash for a negative charge. Okay. Let us suppose we have a neutral silver atom on the site. That's a defect. Okay. So this neutral silver atom would be silver on a silver site with a negative charge relative to what's normally there. Okay. So this is a, sil a neutral silver atom is AG, AG minus negative charge. Normally there's a positive charge. This is one less charge than what's normally there, so it's negative. It's negatively charged with respect to the lattice. This is important because this is, in terms of the lattice, this acts like a negative charge there. Okay. Suppose we have a vacancy. A vacancy on a bromine site. Okay, a vacancy on a bromine site. This would be V A is the symbol for vacancy. It's on the bromine lattice. Okay, and it has normally there'd be a negative charge there. Now there's no charge there. So it's a positive charge relative to what's normally there. Okay, so this is a vacancy on the bromine site, positive charge relative to what's normal. Normally there is a um, negative charge there, now there's no charge, so it's positive. So this acts as a positive charge, this would act as a positive charge carrier in the lattice, this would act as a negative charge carrier, these two would attract each other. There would tend to be a, a tendency to have a vacancy silver pair. We could have an interstitial site. So here's the interstitial site. This is an interstitial lattice. And let's say we have a silver ion on the interstitial site. Okay, a silver ion on the interstitial site. We write silver. So on the interstitial site, so we put an I down here to indicate that it's the interstitial lattice. And the interstitial lattice normally has no charge. This is a silver ion, so we do put a, let's say, so that's a silver ion on the interstitial site. Okay, let's suppose we have a negative ion here, and on this negative ion we have a charge. We have an electron. And this you can observe. You can observe you have a negative, you have a, there's no bromine here, but there's an electron in there. The electron's going around and around. There's an orbital. The orbital is not going around positive ion in the center, positive charge in the center. It's being constrained by a positive spherical positive cloud around it. So around this hole, there's a spherical positive cloud. You put an electron in there, it'll form an orbit. Okay, be loosely bound. Uh, this would be a vacancy on the bromine site, and uh, it has a no charge relative to what is normally there. Okay, and this thing here actually is called an F-center. An F center is a trapped electron on a negative ion in a negative ion vacancy in an ionic salt. Okay, F for F, F is the German word for Farbe, which means color, so this is called the color center. And the reason it's called a color center is because if you have a crystal that has F centers in it, it usually has a color, because these things are loosely bound and they can be ionized with the, the ionization potential is approximately equal to in the wavelength of visible light. If you want to form some of these, take some, it's kind of cute, you take some salt, take some sodium chloride powder, put it in a, uh, in a glass tube and put a vacuum on it. Okay, then take a Tesla coil, you know what a Tesla coil is, a discharge induction coil, you turn it on and sparks come out of the thing, use it to test for vacuums. Just hit the thing with the Tesla coil at top blast and you'll see that your sodium chloride turns orange, because orange is the, the, the ionization potential of this thing is in orange light. Okay? Then if you wait a while, a couple of hours, you'll see this orange color fades. Okay, as the sites disappear, the thing kind of diffuses in around it. If you do it with potassium chloride, it's purple, rubidium chloride is green, and you can get these color centers, they're kind of cute. If you heat it, 
what you're doing when you set the Tesla coil is you're blasting the bromine out of the, you're just blasting bromine out, or bromine or chlorine or whatever it is, but you have to leave the electron behind, of course, because the thing has to remain neutral. So you hit it with the high voltage uh, electron discharge, you knock your bromine out as a bromine atom, it leaves its electron behind. Okay, so that's a color center. And that's another kind of defect you can get, and all these defects are there. What is this uh, silver atom? The other way to look at this, this kind of defect, which is a silver atom on the silver site, is that this is an electron in the conduction band. Okay, because really this is a silver ion which has an extra electron. There's an extra electron here that shouldn't be there. That electron can very easily hop to the na neighboring silver. So here, this is like a silver ion with an electron. So it's a neutral silver. This electron can hop over to here. This then becomes a neutral ion. And the electron can hop from silver to silver very easily. Okay, and this is electronic conduction. It's not ionic conduction. Ionic conduction, the whole the nucleus has to move, that's an ionic conductor. The silver ion has to move. There's no motion here of the silver, it's just a hopping of the electron from one site to the next. So this defect, which you consider, this defect, which you could consider to be, if you write it this way, okay, but this defect is also written sometimes as simply an electron in the conduction band. Okay, and if you have this kind of defect, you'll get. Okay, so if you take silver bromide and you dope it with excess silver, and the excess silver would go here, you would get that probably doesn't actually do that, but that's how it would work. Now, if you have a bromine, uh, let's say you take a, a neutral bromine atom here. So in the Kroger notation, this would be bromine on a bromine site uh, with a positive charge. You see why we do this, too, because this is really in a negative charge. It's, it's, it's a negative. Okay, this is a bromine on a bromine site with a net positive charge relative to what's normally there. And this is an electron hole in the valence band. Okay, so, and this then, too, is an a bromine which is lacking an electron. So the electron from a neighboring bromine can hop into here, making this the bromine. And then a neighboring bromine can hop into here. Okay, and the hole, the net positive, the net positive hole moves around, but there's no transport of the bromine nucleus. It's just the electron hops here, then the electron hops here, and the electron hops here, and this hole is moving moving along. Okay. So that's a positive electronic conductor, a whole conduction. That's an electronic conduction. There's no motion of the ions. Okay, and that's your electron in the belt. If you consider the band structure of silver bromide, here you have the conduction band, which is normally full. This is your gap here. And up here you have your uh, conduction the valence band is full. You have your conduction band. These electrons here are the electrons which are on the bromines. This valence band is empty. Is the extra space up here? If you have a promotion, if an electron moves from the conduction band, from the valence band up to the conduction band, what happens now is an electron moves from the valence con valence band to the conduction band. This then forms an electron which can move through the crystal, and this is an electron hole which can move through the crystal. You know, your semiconductor theory, but this promotion, talk about an electron promoting from the valence band to the conduction band, what that actually is in terms of uh, this model is simply the electron from the bromine pops up over to here. So the bromine becomes a neutral bromine, the silver becomes a neutral silver, so this is the hole and this is the electron. That electron can then move and the hole can then move by an electron of conduction. If these two things come together, they can recombine, the electron can pop over this way, and that has an annihilation, and that's simply the electron dropping back down into the hole again. Anyway, this is your Kroger notation for uh, So if you ever see this, it's used a lot in the ionic crystals. Uh, so the... Um, and the concentration of these various things, and the con certainly the concentration of defects, of this kind of defects can affect the electronic conduction. If you have these kinds of defects, you have electronic conduction. Uh, ionic conduction also occurs by hopping, through, not through electrons and holes, but if you have a, uh, if you have a, for example, if you have a, a bromine vacancy, okay, then this bromine can hop 
hop into here. This is actually transport of the nucleus. This bromine hops over here, and now the vacancy is moved here, and the vacancy can move. You say the vacancy moves, it's really vacancy moves. This thing hops, and then another thing hops in, so the vacancy is moving along, but that's a transport. If the vacancy is a bromine vacancy, it has a net positive charge, so that's a transfer of positive ionic charge that way. Also, diffusion occurs that way. If you have a perfect crystal with no defects, you, your diffusion coefficient is basically zero. The things can't move. The only way things move in ionic crystal is by hopping. Either you can hopping, ions can hop, uh, or electrons can hop in electronic conduction. Similarly, if you have a silver, say, in the uh, interstitial site, then it can easily hop to a neighboring interstitial site, then move to the next interstitial site because there's nothing there. So interstitials, defects can hop, vacancies can hop by simply the uh, next atom moves, and that gets you both diffusion and ionic conduction. If you have these neutral silvers and bromines, that gives you your electronic and polar conduction. And that's the notation it gives. Is it for liquid and or solid? Uh, yeah, it works for liquid too. Um, diffusion, not so much in liquid. Well, in li yeah, okay, yeah. In liquid, you don't really have uh, diffusion. In liquid, is and ionic conduction is somewhat different because you don't need a defect. It can move through. So, uh, no, I would say it isn't really. You don't. These the notation is used for solid crystals. Diffusion and. Um, I guess you'd say diffusion and ionic conduction in a liquid are my, uh, well, the liquid can, I mean, the two atoms move apart and things can move through, like here. However, this, this whole conduction thing, of course, is important, the, elect the electronic conduction, because you do get hopping in a, um, if you take a, uh, if you take a, um, a slag, Slag SiO2, CaO, FeO, whatever. Liquid slag. The liquid slag is normally an ionic conductor. There's no electronic conduction in it. But if you have Fe2 plus and you have Fe3 plus, you have a significant amount of, of if you have only Fe2 plus or only Fe3 plus, then it's an, only an ionic conductor. But if you have some of both, then electrons can hop, because here you have an iron ion, Fe2+, plus, and next to it you have an Fe3+, plus. the electron can hop, an electron can hop like this. This becomes a 2+, plus, this becomes a 3+. Plus. The ions don't have to move. They stay there, the electron just hops. Okay, so as long as you have a reasonable concentration, or another, then another iron 3+, plus comes here and the electron hops again. And you will find this if you then change the oxygen pressure if the oxygen pressure is very low or very high, very low you have only this, very high you have only this. If you have a me medium oxygen pressure where you have a reasonable amount of moles, the electronic conductivity will, will increase. You can certainly... Um, so the slags containing iron or containing other ions that, can, that have two oxidation states, a slag containing only, say, silicon CaO or only silica CaO and no iron, only these, I mean calcium and sodium only have one oxidation state for all intents and purposes. These slags will be purely ionic with no electronic conduction. But if you start putting in iron, basically under any oxygen pressure, you're going to get an electronic conduction. Uh, and manganese, chromium, things that have two oxidation states will give you electronic conduction. The electronic conduction basically depends upon the product of the concentrations of this times this, because that's the probability of the two of them being together. To get an ionic conduction, electronic conduction, these things have to be close together. The probability of them being close together is basically the product of the mole fraction. So, um, how does that work? Um, The classic experiment, how did it go? Yeah. Um,
Let's take a break. Let's take a 10 minute break.